This is episode 74 of the Immunology Podcast, Dengue Pathogenesis with Dr. Nalika Malavijay. Hey everyone, this is Dr. Jason Goldsmith and Dr. Brenda Raud. Welcome back to the Immunology Podcast. We have conversations with immunologists. The Immunology Podcast is brought to you by Stem Cell Technologies, a global biotechnology company supporting life science research and fostering communication and collaboration in science. If you enjoy the Immunology Podcast, rate us and leave us a review. We're always looking for feedback on how the podcast can be improved and for suggestions on guests. Today, we have Dr. Nalika Malavijay from the USJ in Sri Lanka on the podcast to talk about her research in the pathogenesis of dengue infections. We've also got our usual roundup of recent highlights in the immunology news coming up. But first, a reminder that Immunology 2024 meeting is happening in Chicago, Illinois from May 3 to 7. Be sure to visit the exhibit hall for leading scientific companies showcasing their products and services, exhibitor workshops, and poster sessions during the daily and opposed presentation times. Visit immunology2024.aai.org for more information. It's getting closer. Indeed, like two months and no, counting. No, I owe you dinner reservations. I got to go set up, but I'll work. Okay. Hey, it's Chicago. It's like one of the capitals of the U.S. for food. Yes, I'm looking forward to that uh, deep dish pizza. And Jason is just, no, no. I'm an East Coaster that way now. No. <laughs> no that's not, that's not food. That's not a pizza. That's a uh, John casserole. Stewart has an amazing rant on uh, Chicago deep dish pizza. Oh, yes. I think I watched it actually. <laughs> you know, actually, Argentinian pizza, it's something else. You don't get it anywhere outside of Argentina. In what way is it different? I don't know. It's kind of a little bit like has a, like a thicker crust, very crunchy. The cheese we have is like very greasy. Oh, it's great. Um, I think it's closer to the American style. So here we you get everywhere here in the Europe is like Neapolitan pizza, which is tasty, but it's really hard to eat because it's so thin and it's just just you know just uh, what's those words? You ever done the New York down? pizza where you can just fold it up in your hand and go? I love that. I I love folding pizza. I think it's great. That's uh, I respect that way of eating. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, it's okay. I don't think it's the best beach in the world, but I do respect the fold and eat. It is a superior way to grab and go a pizza. Well, we don't want to grab and go for too long. We should probably discuss some interesting papers for the week. I'll pull up one and call rectal cancer and immunology. I actually thought this was super interesting. It actually abuts some of my uh, postdoc work, actually which I thought was interesting to see as well. So first author is Norihito Goto. Last author is Omer H. Yilmaz. And the title coming out in Nature on uh, the 28th of February is SOX-17 enables immune evasion of early colorectal adenomas and cancers. So important things to know, kind of as a little background, is colon cancer has a pretty set mutation system that's very well defined. And so you get one mutation and another one. And then another one. And so the first mutation is APAC, then there's a KRAS mutation, and then there's a um, P53. And then that sets you up for adenomas, and then a couple other mutations lead to metastatic disease, right? And the cool thing is that you can do any one of these mutations or multiple of these mutations in organoid systems and then implant those organoids under the epithelial barrier of a mouse and then develop a primary tumor there. Um, difficulty just for people who want to know with metastatic colon cancer in mouse models is often the tumor gets too big to obstruct the colon and that'll be what is lethal for the mouse as opposed to metastatic disease. And in humans, it's different because our lumen is much bigger compared to the size of us, right? And so we actually develop metastatic disease before we develop colon impaction. And in mice, it's backwards. And so having metastatic disease is more difficult in mice. They'll often passage it from one mouse to another. So take the adenoma out of one mouse, put it back in, inject it, let it keep going. Just so you know, they don't do that here, but people wonder about metastatic colon cancer models. And it's difficult because of like space. So that being said, they use AKP. So APC, KRAS, and P53 organoid null. So these are, these are pre, you know, adenomas, and they inject them into mice. They're trying to see what's happening with the immune response early and late. Because what we see is some people have early cancer, it's identified, killed. And then in other cases, it keeps going, and you have massive immunosuppression of the tumor microbiome. 
So what they want to understand is the epigenetic evolution and say, look, the trap to scriptopic epigenetic change that permits CRC progression in vivo using this orthotopic transplantation into the colon model I kind of talked about already. And they have like TD tomato tracers built into it with the CRISPR system so they can trace everything going on. And you can also, and they also, as part of the work here, in addition to this model, use ones that are spontaneous, you know, mutations built into the mouse that they can either then induce with tamoxifen or what have you to then turn on more mutations and then develop ad spontaneous adenomas versus implants. So they use both systems here. But to start with this, look at the colon cancer. They look at late versus early. They do some RNA-seq. I don't know if they previously did this for some other study and they're just telling the story here, but the story is they just decided to do this one day and did it um, and then did orthogonal methods with hairpin RNA. Long and short, they found that increased chromin accessibility to the SOX family. So SOX2, SOX3, SOX4, SOX6, SOX9, SOX10, SOX15, and SOX17. So all the suppressors of cytokine signaling. Um, not all of them, but most of them. And they saw that as you went on, progressed, that the ones that progressed, the early tumor, had the SOX17 activation that went alongside a switch or drive up of genes known to be the fetal transcriptome. So that's where it butts my work is there's this alternative stem cell state, which is the fetal like state that's been previously described. It's used in injury repair and response. It's notably LGR5 negative, which is the marker of stem cell niches, but it is a stem cell like program. It's just not the adult stem cell it has a bunch of interesting properties and wound healing and other weird stuff. It's like this alternative state that our bodies can switch into that is pre-fetal land, but, but it's fetal-like in its origin. And so what they found is that, hey, SOX17 is driving all this. There's this fetal-like state, but then the kicker is they found that if you look at the immune compartment, there's much less immune infiltration in this SOX17 high fetal-like state of the tumors. And then they look at killing, and of course, the ones that are SOX17 high don't die, and that's what leads to the progressed tumors. So you need SOX17 to drive the tumor forward. And if you look at knockout mice, immune system knockout, so immunodeficient mice, um, they don't kill SOX high or SOX low tumor. So it's something about the, the immune system is recognizing, can recognize a SOX17 low state, not a SOX17 high state. Well, what's happening here, and not to, you know, I, you can go into all the detail here, and I, I, I have a tendency to nerve out, but to be a little briefer, SOX17 suppresses interferon gamma signaling. And it does this in a couple ways, but one of the ways it does this is down-regulating your, um, your MHC1. And so what's happening is you're having less of that MHC1 on the adenoma, which is leading to less immune killing. And they really then map this out. So they show that immunocompetent mice, if you knock out SOX1 or SOX17, you get killing of the tumor. You can go in with a SOX17 inhibitor or a knockout after, or an inhibitor, but a knockout. And then the tumors will get ablated by the immune system. If you, if you take TOX17 high, constitutively active, organoids and implant them they all progress to disease if you ablate it you get rid of it but the immune system through an interferon gamma mechanism which they then they, they map that out too it's why it's a nature papers they go through all the steps of the pathway this interferon system which is driving cd8 cytotoxic cells and cd4 cells and if you have high socks 17 you have mostly t regs and immunosuppressive exhausted cd8s Right, but this interferon gamma environment is suppressed with SOX17 high with a switch to the fetal program and down regulation MHC1. And that seems to be one of the main ways in which colon cancer evades the immune system and thus progresses. And they like delete MHC1 to recapitulate the phenotype and do all the good work. And then they show, of course, Human adenomas and CRCs all express SOX17 almost ubiquitously. If you have advanced disease, it has to be there. And so they also show that it induces these immune silent LGR5 cells because it inhibits LGR5 production, 
or uh, the G. Sock 17 does. And so they really map it out and make the basically directly show that SOC 17 binds to the promoter and introns of LGR5. So it's this direct switch control, basically through selective pressure of immune killing everything else. The only way to get out of the immune killing environment is to become a SOC 17 high cell. And so that has to happen for cancer to progress, which suggests it's a pretty good target to go after to suppress SOC 17 and then throw that on top of immunotherapy and you can go kill your colon cancer. And now I'm done. That's very interesting. I really like those examples of what would be the expression, kind of the selection bias that you see what you see, we don't because only what you see is <laughs> in a way. It's like there's a famous um, example of an airplane where they were shot yeah. in World War II. All the airplane shots were in the wings and everything else. And those are the only ones that came back. And so like, oh, no, you know, we need to armor the wings more. Yeah, yeah. Some smart guys like, no, 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 no. These are the ones that come back. Yeah. That means all the ones that don't come back are getting shot in the fuselage and everywhere else. And that's what we need to armor. Yeah. Because clearly yeah, exactly. this is the one that's survivor bias. Is that the survivor bias? Yeah, that's the expression I was looking for. Um, because so one thing is that when it comes to the, the, the response to interferon gamma, so usually interferon gamma will upregulate MHC expression but this is something that you don't see in this particular it all in, shut down so that cycles just shut off because mhc is suppressed and so if interferon gamma is there you don't have mhc1 have a feed forward feed forward loop it's just mm. cut off at the knee yeah. they don't yeah, pop up the mhc1 because it's this fetal like state and how about then uh other cells that might nk cells for example that might recognize do they look at that at all they don't. They look mostly the CD8 and CD4 compartments, but basically there's just not a lot of immune infiltration into the cancer. Yeah. When the yeah, would, state. Yeah, I would say also in case don't don't um, infiltrate tumors that well yeah. to start with. It's just sitting there. All right. Well, I mean, if we're going to move from tumor, we, we're at the tumor uh, topic. Why don't we just continue? Uh, and then let me talk to you about, you know, the the, the bad players in tumor immunity which are, of course, T-Rex. Um, this paper that I, I, I picked, I, I have, you know, I, I, I find it very interesting when there's papers that talk about unexpected uh, connections between things like metabolism and, and immune signaling, things like that. Um, and I thought this paper was an interesting um, addition to the what has become quite known, which is the effect of lactic acid on T-Rex. So lactic acid is highly prevalent in the tumor microenvironment. And this is in part because of the Warburg effect on the on the tumor cells. They consume a lot of glucose, but they don't, uh, but a lot of the uh the source carbons uh, are just shuttled out in form of lactate uh, because usually they're mitochondrial, they don't have they have they have a very high highly glycolytic metabolism compared to the mitochondrial metabolism, and therefore you end up with a lot of of lactic acid. And so it has been well known that usually lactic acid is detrimental for the function of conventional T cells. But then, I think more recent times it became also apparent that not only is it bad for conventional T cells, but it seems to actually be a source of fuel and, 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 and something actually positive for t regulatory T cells. It does look like T-Rex have the capacity of consuming lactic acid of, and seem to have some adaptations to survive under like higher lactic acid conditions. And this is one of kind of, there's, there's been already been to a bunch of publications last year, and this is just another example of how uh, people seem to be finding lactic acid uh, affecting T-Rex. Uh, Function. So that paper is called Lactate Modulase RNA Splicing to Promote CTLA4 Expression in Tumor Infiltrating Regulatory T Cells. And it was published in Immunity. First authors, uh, Rui Ding, Xiaoshan Shu, I'm sorry, and Xilin Hu. Um, probably butchered these names. I'm really sorry, guys. Uh, from uh, corresponding author, uh, Qian Zhou from Shanghai University. Um, and 
basically what they look at is that um I I like the story, but I have to admit I found it a little bit all over the place. Um but I I think it's still a solid story, but I think there were some missing spots and some unclear connections. But basically what they look at, you now they they speak about the importance for splicing uh and T cell and uh, development. Um and they 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 show that for some in some there's some molecules which we know that you know the different splicing can have an effect. Um and Somehow they are uh, drawn into looking at the effect of uh, alternative splicing in CDLA4 expression, um, and uh, and they connect this with uh, lactic acid, and this is uh, this is kind of how they go about it. So they, let, let's start with lactic acid in, in T. Rex. So in this in this work, basically they look into uh, conditional knockouts of T. Rex with the lactate transporter, which is necessary. To uh, for T. Rex to consume external lactate of so this MC, MCT1 transporter, um, and what they show is that if you have a conditional knockout of this MCT1 in T. Rex, you see basically a, a stark reduction in lactate uptake, and this results in an attenuated suppression in vivo. So you have less tumor growth if you have a, a, a model of of, of tumor uh, in in mice. And what is interesting, I think this is kind of what's interesting, is that they see that if you do CTLA4 blockade, uh, this positive effect on, so this reduction of tumor growth as a consequence of CTLA blockade uh, is something that there's you don't see so much, uh, you don't see anymore in uh, MCT1 knockout. So these T cells that are MCT1 knockout, they already express lower CTLA4 levels, and that makes them less uh, this is suggests that this makes them less um, likely to respond to CTLA4 blockade. I have a little bit of issues with this because the truth is that when they knock out this transporter, they basically have a stark reduction in CTLA, CTLA4 expression and also uh, basically, basically some kind of immuno, sub, immuno autoimmune phenotype on this T-Rex. So the T-Rex, no, sorry, uh, no, not for the not for the lactic. So they just see less uh less suppression in tumors and uh and and then they show also that if they pretreat T-Rex with lactate, uh this seems to make them more suppressive. They they do adoptive transfer of T-Rex that have been pre um treated with lactate, they make them more suppressive in tumor models. And this it comes together with an increased DLA4 expression. And um so they kind of jump a little bit because then they look into uh, single 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 cell RNA seq from uh, colorectal cancer uh, uh, tumor infiltrating lymphocytes, and I think that's kind of a little bit of a weak part of the paper because it's basically just correlation that they see. But they, they see that T Rex in the in, in in this tumor infiltrating T Rex have a high signature of RNA splicing related pathways. So they really seem to to depend on, on a bunch of RNA uh, splicing uh, machinery, and they they zeroed in uh, this USP thirty nine, uh, which is part of uh, which is a uh, ubiquitin specific peptidase thirty nine, which is associated with some of the uh, SNRNPs, which are part of the spliceome, the the splicing machinery, and they seem this the expression of this particular uh, gene. Uh, it's correlated to the expression of both the uh, transporter, this lactate transporter, and CTLA4 in this tumor infiltrating lymphocytes, T-Rex, on T-Rex, uh, tumor infiltrating T-Rex. They also see a correlation of the expression of FOXP3 mRNA with the expression of this uh, USP39. Uh, so basically, they and this is from human data, and they kind of see this kind of correlation of expression between these this, uh, elements. So they go on to a mouse model and they actually delete USP39 conditionally on FOXP3 positive cells. And this is where they see uh, an almost scurfy-like phenotype. They saw autoimmunity uh, after a couple of weeks. Uh, and they see T cells that, you know, have very low expression of FOXP3, CTLA4, uh, IL-10, and, and low expression of CTLA4 and and um, 
another activation kind of activation markers in T-Rex. Uh, they see this seems to be kind of specific for T-Rex. They don't see the same level of of, of uh, um, modification. Of, they don't see such a disruption on the conventional T cell uh, uh, side if they have a CD4 CRE model. Um, they do see some impaired simulation upon secondary uh, activation, but it's not as strong as the phenotype they see on T-Rex. If they delete, and then they so then they work into a more um, condi not more uh, 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 things a tamoxifen induced knockout, so they can have the mice, um, and they they show that uh, if they delete uh, USB. 39 in tumor bearing mice, they they see decrease in tumors in the in the, uh, the of T Rex in the tumor, but not in the spleen, and they see lower expression of CTLA4. So they seem to have kind of correlation or some kind of causation because it's mostly on CTLA4, and they don't uh, uh, doesn't really affect so much other T Rex markers such as Fox3, IL2 uh, receptor, PD1 don't seem to be affected by the knockout of this protein later on, right? Not during initial development of the mice. Uh, and they also see that if the deletion of the lactate transporter doesn't really add up, so it seems to be that really the this USP39 uh, knockout is somewhere downstream from lactate, whatever lactate is doing. Um, so, and here's where I wish there was a little bit better um, mechanistic. I think it's a bit bunch of kind of correlation, but I think it kind of makes sense. What they see is that when, when they try to make the connection between, you know, lactate, USB 39, this splicing uh, protein and uh, CTLA-4, what we see that they show is that splicing of functional CTLA-4 depends on having USB 39 and the increase of USB 39 expression results in increased expression of CTLA-4. And then when it comes to USP39, they show that this uh, that the connection between that and lactate is that lactate induces FOXP3 expression in vitro. And this one they do is in vitro experiments. They can induce FOXP3 expression with lactate. And then this results in FOXP3 upregulating the expression of USP39 because there is actually a FOXP3 binding site in the promoter of USP39. So in a way, you know. More likely that comes through this transporter that they knocked out in some of the experiments results in more FOXP3 and fo more FOXP3 results in more USP39, which is important for the correct splicing of ETLA4, which in the end is very important for T-Reg function uh, in the tumor in, in the tumor setting. So less ETLA4 does really affect the suppressive function of T-Regs. So I thought it was it was very interesting. I, I you know I find it's like just basically this is more Fox P3, uh, but I think it's another uh, instance of showing how lactate seems to be really uh, capable of affecting Fox P3 function identity in a, in a way that I don't think we necessarily expected a couple of years ago. Yeah, it's interesting. I was waiting for you to explain the Warburg effect linkage of the lactate being up to the Fox P3. That's the thing. They don't do a lot. I, I I think there are some papers showing a little bit more work, how this increase in FOXP3 happens from lactate. I think it has to do with acetylation of FOXP3. This FOXP3 is acetylated, and then you having more lactate kind of shifts the balance of free acetyl groups. Uh, but don't take my word on that. I have to say I'm a little bit outdated on, on, on this uh, particular uh, part of the immunometabolism field. It's interesting. Yeah, it's like missing that one step, I guess. Yeah. All right. Well, we can't dwell on it. Otherwise, we'll build up some lactate ourselves. <laughs> I'm getting so exhausted. I, I, guess I will jump to autoimmunity as a short stop from T Regs. This is in Nature Immunology. Title is The Astrocyte Produced Growth Factor HBEGF, Limits Autoimmune CNS Pathology, published the 26th of February. First author is Matthias Linnerbauer, and last author is Viet Rothhammer. So this, this is essentially an MS paper. 
but in animal models. So that's why it's all about autoimmune um, encephalopathy and central nervous disease. It's not truly MS, right? Because mice and MS, you, we have models, but it's not real. Um, that being said, what they're looking at is there's this notion that there's some people with MS who have like one incident, maybe two and nothing else. And other people who just hit this cycle and then keep going with the cycle over. And that's what the typical MS is where they're better and then they're worse and they have new lesions and new inflammation. And so that there is probably heterogeneity in what they're trying to understand in astrocytes and microglia that alter this inflammatory course in different people. So they look at those patient populations, people who just, you know, had some other controls, some people had just an early incident, nothing else, and people with the standard like recurring disease, and then compare those to see if they can find anything that's different. And they found through mass spec that HBEGF, which is heparin binding EGF-like growth factor, is right at the center of this. So they find then that hypoxic conditions upregulate this and pro-inflammatory conditions suppress it through epigenetic modification. And that its effects are really central to what you see in the disease state, at least in early models of EAE model systems, right? Because they, they, can't, they can't go do an effect study in, in people. But they show that essentially it is the HIF, you know, HIF-1, our standard hypoxic-induced factor, is a promoter that drives us to go. And that the more of this you have early on in people and in mouse models, the better off the mouse or a person is from having disease. And it actually isn't the and actually you see it drop down a little bit in the serum, but it goes way up in the CSF. So it actually matters. It's neurolo neurologically associated from astrocyte origin and they, they do origin tracing with promoters and and tracers tracer strains right to show that it's really cns mediated hb egf that's 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 the important thing here all right so you got a molecule it seems to be important what's it do well one it, it results in faster recovery and less injury to begin with so it has this effect um, to alter oligodendrocyte lineage cells. And really, um, if it's gone, those cells don't recover after injury, so you don't get remyelination. So part of this is it helps after injury just recover normally. Um, it also kind of keeps immune cells away. They don't, they don't have a ton of detail on this, but they basically see you have these tissue protective factors and less immune infiltration with this going up. They also then look at what's driving it. So they find that the aryl hydrocarbon receptor and HIF are opposites of each other, right? So HIF makes it go up. The aryl hydrocarbon receptor through its binding partner binds and is inhibitory promoter, right? You know, it's not a promoter. It's an inhibitory transcription factor. And so if they knock that out, you get more of it, and that's protective. And so that's important because now you can start thinking about drugging it, right? And so they can do things like nasal HIF um, to get it into the brain or, you know, have they did SHRNA systems and mice and did a bunch of different things to show that you could, if you can drive this up, you get better response of EAE in EAE. And it communicates across the blood-brain barrier, and then you just get less immune infiltration when it's high. So by it floating around, you're just going to get less of polarized activated CD4 cells. You're going to get less, you're going to get more tissue repair and thus it's tissue protective. How it does all of this, they don't go into here. I think that's why it's not, you know, it's a nature immunology, not a nature, nature paper, but like that'd be a ton of work. Like how does this molecule work on 50 different cells? So at a certain point you got to like stop. Um, but they then do look in people and they can, and, and there, there's epigenetic, Oh, by the way, there's epigenetic modifiers. So that's the other thing. Initial injury in people seems to, in a subset, epigenetically modify the gene and methylate it in such a way that you have less the next time. So if you're unlucky and with your first episode of MS or neural inflammation, you get epigenetically modified the wrong way, you're then predisposed to more of these 
episodes with neurological injury leading to worse outcomes and other people you aren't suppressed, if that makes sense. And so that's what sets up the downstream disease course. And so if you have more of this, you are protected from more severe injury later on. And they show that as true in people as well. Then they do treatment models in the animals. So it's pretty cool. Like it's pretty clearly central to your downstream outcomes and that disease bifurcation, kind of similar to the previous paper I talked about. So you're finding a specific molecule that's really determining disease fate. But in this case, it's, it's luck at being methylated or not. And if it's turned off, you're hosed, basically. And what are the options to turn it on? So you can use uh, chemotherapeutics that are anti-methylation. Then give mm -hmm. it that after initial MS episode, you can do, you know, you could do an mRNA for the protein in people with MS and give that to them once in a while. I'd, you, could, you could even do gene therapy. You could do intranasal sprays of it if enough gets into the CNS that way. Mm -hmm. Different ideas. That's very, that's very exciting. They do some mouse uh, intranasal, um, just straight intranasal delivery of the protein. Mm. And that works. Mm -hmm. Gets their blood brain barrier. And that could okay. be enough, right? Like imagine just a nasal spray weekly for like people with MS. So they stop relapsing because you can't fix the methylation, for instance. Yeah. You just give it, and then they stop having flares. Well, I hope that it is an actionable, an actionable thing that it can actually be used to prevent uh, recurrence, right? Because then you would expect that they would, if you could shift this balance and maybe you could prevent recurrence. Uh, so for ending today's uh, journal club, <clears throat> I have a, I think it's a quick story, but I, I thought it's kind of cool again, you know, unexpected things. Um, this paper is about uh, kind of a large study that looked into what happens, whether you can find and what happens if you find humans that don't have a very or have a mutation, a very what is considered a very important part of T cell development, which is this pre-alpha chain. Um, so the, the paper is called The Immunopathological Landscape of Human Pre-TR Alpha Deficiency from Rare to Common Variants. Uh, and it was published in Science. Um, first authors Marie Materna and the there's a lot of authors. Um, this is clearly a large uh, um, effort, um, but the corresponding author is Vivian Bessiat from the uh, INSERM in France, in Paris, which is the French National Institute of Health and Medical Research, uh, in this case associated to the University of Paris. Um, and what they did in this paper is basically they look into... Uh, they really looked into databases and they found people that had uh, loss of function mutations in these pre TCR alpha uh, gene. And the pre TCR alpha gene is, is considered to be very important because during uh, T cell development in the thymus, there is a step in which uh, the, so the, the both, the both. Uh, uh, chains are not expressed during development at the same time, you know, the alpha and the a beta chain. So we're talking about alpha, beta T cells. Um, the beta chain is expressed first, gets recombined first, and it's expressed on the surface together with this known as a pre, uh, T, uh, pre uh, uh, T cell alpha chain. And then only after does the actual recombinated, uh, rearranged T cell alpha chain express and replace and uh, the, the, this TCR alpha, this pre TCR alpha one, and then you get a final functional TCR alpha beta uh, receptor. Um, and so the expectation is that if you don't have that pre TCR, pre, -alpha, pre TCR alpha uh, gene, then you cannot have development of T cells, of alpha beta T cells. And it's funny because they were surprised to find actually not a lot, but they actually within their their databases they could identify ten patients that had a an expected, a predicted loss of function, homozygous loss of function, 
which suggests that they did not have, according to you know the the uh, protein sequence, they would not have a productive pre TCR alpha chain, uh, either because there was you know uh, uh, truncated or the splicing was wrong or the mRNA. So this was some, some of them, the mRNA was not stable. So basically no protein, functional protein. And so they pick up these 10 patients and they were surprised to see that actually from the 10 patients, six of them didn't have a distinguishable um, phenotype. So they were, they seemed normal. There were four people that did have some kind of immune deficiency or autoimmunity or some kind of issue. Um, but they were all alive and, and more or less functional. So um, kind of bring a long story short, because they do a lot of trying to understand what kind of, what kind of mutations they find. I mean, you have this loss of function, but there's also some mutations that reduce the functionality. Uh, they find that they're not as uncommon as they thought they would be. They see that uh, they can find, be found, you know, in the... So they, for some of these, they, they're found in one in one in 10,000 people in certain populations, things like that. So it's not that that rare. Um, and when you see basically what is the main phenotype that you see in these people is you do see a reduction in the amount of alpha, beta T cells, particularly in younger patients. So, but this seems to kind of uh, normalize a bit in older patients because the niche seems to be filled up with memory cells. They don't have that many naive alpha beta cells, but they do have memory cells that seem to fill up the niche in the end. Interestingly, they have, all of them have a um, clear increase in the amount of gamma delta T cells, uh, which gamma delta development does not require this pre-alpha TCR. So probably they become a little bit favored in the development in the thymus. So you do have an increase of these cells. Uh, and what is funny is that in the end, they couldn't really figure out how are these alpha beta T cells coming out? Because if there's no functional pre-TCR alpha, how is that TCR beta, you know, stabilizing the surface? So they, they tried to think if there was some, you know, uh, a premature TCR alpha expression, and that she said doesn't seem to be the case. They wanted to see if maybe uh, TCR delta uh, chain could be uh, acting as a surrogate, and that doesn't seem to seen some in vitro experiments showing that you cannot really stabilize a beta chain with a TCR delta. And actually, most of these the few T cells that do make it don't really have a function of TCR delta anyway. So that's not like they could have taken that spot. So it's, I thought it's funny that in the end, it's not really clear how those alpha beta T cells are coming out. Um, but they, they do find some of them. Um, and so, on, and then they identify a different type of kind of partial loss, partial uh, reduction of function in which one of the, key amino acids in this pre-TCR alpha chain that you know stabilizes the the um, binding to the beta uh, chain is changed by a different with a completely different amino acid and this does reduce the stability of this complex but uh, and, and the patients that have this uh, mutation have some increased incidence of autoimmunity as they go older uh, but in general they look fine. Uh, so I think it was kind of surprising that this, uh, this, this deficiency exists and that patients survive it. Uh, and this particular, this, this partial deficiency that I just mentioned can be found in some places and populations in Asia and, and, and the Middle East up to a 1% allele frequency, which is pretty high for, uh, for, for, for that. And um, so I think, yeah, I think they still need to figure out what's going on. Uh, but in general, it's very interesting. Well, the fact that there's that autoimmune bias, I think, is fascinating, right, with a specific T cell receptor. So I wonder if that's a signal to some other more profound truths. 
Yeah, well, I wonder, I I didn't, I don't know what they say about regulatory thesis, but if you have less T-Reg output because of these T-Regs do need to be, you know, activated through their TCRs to, to, to develop. So I don't think they actually look into that particularly. Um, so I think that maybe if you have less T-Reg output, then that might in the long term be problematic. Yeah, uh, interesting. All right. We've got to move on, and we're going to be speaking with Dr. Nalika Valavije at the USJ in Sri Lanka in just a moment. Before we get to that, we're excited to announce the launch of a brand new podcast on mentorship and science. Fred and I are both hosts of several episodes of the Lab Coats and Life podcast. Find it at www.labcoatsandlifepodcast.com or wherever you get your podcasts. If you sign up for updates about the Lab Coats and Life podcast before March 27th, you'll be entered into a Lab Coat giveaway. Enter the contest at www.stemcell.com slash lab coat contest. Today for our second part of the show, we have a very special guest today. Uh, we have Professor Nelika Malavije. She is a professor at the, at the USJ University in Sri Lanka and also a head of global dengue program and scientific affairs at the Drugs for Neglected Diseases Initiative, also known as N. Uh, DNDI, a uh, very, very uh, special institution in my opinion. And she's going to be talking to us about her research on dengue uh, and other uh, other diseases. But I think very interesting to talk to her about. Uh, she's very well known for her dengue research. So Dr. Uh, Malavige, thank you so much for joining us today from Sri Lanka. Yes. So, so I, I'm, I'm a big fan of both of you. So really excited to talk to you and uh, be, be in your show. Thank you very much. I think I think dengue is a very interesting disease. Um, of course, uh, not understudied and underfunded, and you know all the things that this kind of tropical quote unquote diseases get. Uh, but also very interesting in how we respond to dengue and how the the disease uh, develops in in, in patients. So maybe uh, we can get a quick primer on what is dengue and maybe given that we are in the immunology podcast how does your immune system respond to dengue and what makes it special yes so dengue has been around for a long time uh, it started causing outbreaks in philippines indonesia you know southeast asia in the 1950s and then you know it gradually gradually exploded to involve uh, the tropics and the subtropics uh, but what you saw last year or i, I hope you saw was because of climate change, uh, you did get local transmission in France, Italy, Spain, and certain parts of the US. And last year was pretty bad in many areas. And this is why I believe uh, this year in January, the WHO declared it an emergency response uh, to, to dengue. And so dengue is, of course, a virus. And what is, and a lot of the, the disease that dengue causes is related to the immune response of the host. Uh, absolutely, yes. So uh, I think because a lot of people know about COVID, um, I think uh, there are a lot of similarities between dengue and COVID. Because, you know, like if you take COVID, most people just get mild illness and, and then just clear the virus. So similarly, uh, a lot of people who are infected with dengue uh, just clear the virus and, and don't show symptoms. But there's, there's a proportion of individuals who do show symptoms. So in 2013, for instance, it was estimated about you know, of the 390 million individuals who are supposedly getting infected with dengue, about you get 100 million symptomatic infections. That's huge. And of those symptomatic infections, then some people develop increased capillary permeability because of endothelial dysfunction, uh, and you get plasma leakage, you get liver dysfunction, organ dysfunction, bleeding, uh, you know, dengue hemorrhagic fever. And it's, uh, so the people who clear the virus uh, actually have a good antiviral response in, in the form of you get good, uh, you know, type one intron response, uh, uh, a very uh, re reduced pro-inflammatory response, and basically you, you get rid of it. But what has shown uh, in uh, like in our studies and, and all over the everybody else is people who actually progress to develop severe disease, uh, endothelial dysfunction, you see this difference early in illness, uh, where they have very high levels of uh, so many different types of 
pro-inflammatory cytokines, lipid mediators. I mean, lipid mediators is one of my favorites. And uh, also a, a delayed or impaired interferon response. Uh, and of course, that this leads to, uh, you know, a sort of cytokine storm uh, and uh, basically a dysfunctional immune response. And, and as you saw in COVID, people with obesity, diabetes, hypertension, kidney disease, and so on, uh, are more prone to develop severe disease. And what has happened over time is uh, earlier, dengue was a childhood illness. Uh, but with the change in epidemiology, what you see everywhere in the world is it's now become predominant to adult infection. Uh, and you see these comorbidities in adults and, and not really children. So, and because you see more and more infections in adults, you get more and more people with severe disease. And also it affects pregnancy, uh, pregnant women in a, re in a really bad way, uh, like COVID. So, so when you do get uh, dengue in pregnancy, uh, it, you're more likely to get severe disease. And especially if you get dengue hemorrhagic fever around the time of delivery, that can be very, very complicated. So it sounds like you can see the signs of severe illness brewing an early illness. But do we know what causes the differences among different people besides predisposition from diabetes? Have you? Yeah, so that's a very good question. Like, okay, what are the underlying factors that lead to severe disease? So if, if you, uh, so the general view, unfortunately, is that dengue is a really mild disease. Uh, but if you if you look at the historical facts, uh, or, or even uh, when what you see in countries which are experiencing dengue, like uh, as a recent illness, the case fatality rates are pretty high. And uh, so anybody who, get, I mean, People with obesity, diabetes, and so on are definitely more prone to develop severe disease, but uh, that doesn't mean people who are otherwise, you know, don't have any of those risk factors don't develop severe disease. So uh, you, you do get severe disease in children with no risk factors, adults with no risk factors. And so unfortunately, there are no biomarkers to predict who will develop severe disease. So how all countries have managed to reduce disease, uh, uh, the fatalities is by uh, monitoring patients. So if, let's say you, you have fever and, you know, dengue mimics many febrile illnesses. So if you have fever, you have to sort of assessed by a doctor every day, uh, uh, clinically your blood pressure, other parameters, and also your blood's taken to see if, if you're developing, you know, thrombocytopenia, you know, reduction in platelet counts with hema concentration. Uh, and then you're, of course, admitted. And uh, the only treatment available is fluid replacement because you leak from your capillaries, and if you don't replace that fluid, then of course people go into shock, uh, uh, organ dysfunction. So a lot of complicated things happen. So a lot of that, uh, the the severe dengue, is meant is in part uh, because of these uh, leakage, because of these loss of, of of fluid homeostasis in a way. And I guess this is mostly just the cytokine storm that you that you mentioned. Uh, are there any treatments that can be applied with people that are ongoing this severe dengue to kind of uh, reduce the the risk of death or like severe more severe illness? So unfortunately, no. This is the whole problem uh, uh, because so far uh, dengue has only affected low income countries and LMICs, uh, mm -hmm. uh, and because it's something that gradually developed, people were thinking of okay, let's keep on giving fluid replacement. People are, you know, having capillary leakage, let's replace fluid. So there has been very limited research going on to finding out, okay, what are the mediators that actually cause leakage mm -hmm. and uh, and what can we do about them, drug targets? So this is one of the areas which was my main research interest to finding out, you know, what, what actually causes this leakage. And uh, so, uh, I mean, you have so many inflammatory mediators increased in dengue. Uh, mediators coming from mast cells, uh, many lipid mediators. Uh, and uh, so when you actually compare the capillary leakage endothelial dysfunction that happens in dengue, when you, you do get all these capillary leakage things happening in other illnesses like sepsis, endothelial dysfunction, sepsis, anaphylaxis. So uh, that's why uh, we started looking at uh, things like platelet activating factor, uh, which we found to be very much elevated 
in, in patients with dengue hemorrhagic fever. Uh, and, uh, uh, and our in vitro studies using endothelial cell lines actually showed that when you do use uh, serum from patients with dengue, you do get this endothelial dysfunction and which can be uh, you know, blocked by platelet fact, uh, factor receptor, fact receptor blockage. And because there were drugs that uh, were, were in use to, to uh, act on PATH, we did two clinical trials uh, targeting PATH, uh, which looked promising. But of course, uh, I, I think uh, something like that, like Rupertidine, which we trialed uh, the two trials, I mean, it looked promising, but Rupertidine alone is not, is not going to be enough. Uh, to, to prevent all these things. And we've been looking at other mediators, not just us others as well, uh, uh, mast cell mediators like leukotrienes, uh, which are again, you know, coming from these arachidonic acid pathways with the phospholipase enzymes. So we've been looking at these pathways, uh, what activates the phospholipase enzymes, how, uh, and uh, then the downstream things like prostaglandin metabolites, leukotrienes, which again, we found leukotrienes extremely uh, high, uh, the metabolites in urine, because those are stable. And, uh, and we know that there are drugs that block uh, leukotrienes like uh, leukotriene receptors, uh, like Montelukast and things. So the, the aim has been, okay, because so many people do develop uh, a leakage uh, when, when you compare, look at the numbers, uh, uh, repurposing you know, certain drugs, whether it would be possible to repurpose certain drugs. So the main mediators we've been looking at are PATH uh, leukotrienes, then the phospholipases. And of course, we've also been looking at, okay, what would protect the endothelium? Because you know, leukotrienes, PATH, uh, 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 all these things cause endothelial dysfunction, but then you know, what actually protects and opposes the action of PATH? PATH. So one of the things we looked at was a sphingosine one phosphatase, uh, and that is also in, in important in T-cell migration and uh, egress of, from lymph nodes and so on. And so S1P uh, opposes the action of PATH uh, by it preserves endothelial uh, barrier integrity. And uh, so uh, what we looked at was in patients, uh, the S1P levels, which we found that patients who were having leakage uh, had very low levels of S1P. So, and, and there are, again, drugs that target S1P. Uh, uh, which is used for multiple sclerosis, so whether these drugs can be repurposed. So uh, our research basically in Sri Lanka uh, to, to, you know, like because drug discovery from scratch takes a very, very long time. So we were thinking of uh, taking a bit of a shortcut here to see, if, you know, if, if we identify mediators that cause endothelial dysfunction, can we find drugs, uh, you know, repurposed drugs uh, to, to, uh, to block these mediators. So this is where... Uh, our research in Sri Lanka has focused on PATH, leukotrienes, uh, prostaglandins, uh, phospholipase enzymes, and those pathways. So shifting gears a little bit to other disease areas, I know you've also done some COVID work, but also really looked at immune responses to vaccines typically not seen in, in the West, so the Sinopharm and Sputnik. Could you talk a little bit about the differences with those and what you've been able to figure out about those vaccines as compared to, you know, the, the, the Western mRNA stuff that came out? Yes. So, so during COVID, everybody was, you know, uh, vaccinating people as fast as you could to, to, to get out and to make sure that life returns to normal. So Sri Lanka is one of the countries that used five different vaccines. So we, we used two mRNA vaccines, uh, the Moderna and uh, the Pfizer. We used uh, the AstraZeneca and the Sputnik, which, which are adenoviral vector vaccines, and also Sinopharm, which is an inactivated uh, uh, vaccine, a whole, whole virus inactivated vaccine. And the vast majority of the population received Sinopharm, uh, but of course, a proportion of uh, individuals also re received AstraZeneca, uh, Sputnik, uh, and uh, uh, Pfizer and Moderna. So uh, we were able to do head-to-head -head comparisons uh, in, in real world, uh, you know, data of, you know, one month after getting the vaccines, what sort of antibody T cell responses do you have? Three months after the second dose, you know, because those days, two doses were considered full vaccination, you know, at, at a particular time. So uh, after two doses of the vaccine, do you, uh, uh, what were the immune responses for these uh, at, at, at the same time point? So, uh, and what we found was uh, the mRNA vaccines, uh, uh, tend to induce 
uh, more robust antibody response uh, in in like so we, we we measured total antibody responses we measured antibodies to s s2 receptor blocking antibodies and uh, uh, and also t cell responses so when you look at antibodies and t cell responses the mrna vaccines were the most immunogenic uh, followed by the adenoviral vector vaccines and uh, uh, astrazeneca and sputnik were more or less the same uh, and something else that happened in Sri Lanka was uh, we got the first dose of uh, Sp uh, Sputnik vaccine, but there's uh, uh, quite a few people didn't get the second dose. And uh, and there were some uh, reports from Russia saying, uh, stating that, you see, I mean, one dose could be enough and you didn't know, need the second dose of the vaccine. So we all also had the opportunity to compare one dose. I mean, I mean the first dose of the Sputnik called the marker did it as Sputnik Light versus the whole Sputnik vaccine and Sinopharm. So if we compare the immunogenicity of these vaccines, it was the mRNA vaccines, two doses of the vector vaccines, one dose of Sputnik, and then the inactivated Sinopharm uh, vaccine that, you know, in that order, uh, the immunogenicity. So, yeah. Uh, so, and uh, we subsequently, of course, looked at um, how things followed up. And uh, interestingly, uh, uh, people who, the vast majority of people who got two doses of Sinopharm also got infected, I mean, either after the first dose or after the second dose immediately. So I think the vast, and, and because it's a whole virus vaccine, you can't differentiate whether they've had the infection or not because they have responses to the end protein, right? Because that was the test that was used to find out whether you were naturally infected or not. So that opportunity was not there. So we had to sort of, we had, consider that the vast majority did get infected. I think I think many many people don't know that the Sputnik it was two different adenoviral vectors. So yes, yes. Uh, it's just like uh, 85 and 80, I forgot the other name. 26, uh, 80, 26, 26, yeah. Yes. So it was uh, 85 and 26 and and I think uh, they had they had the issue in uh, making the 85. Uh, mm -hmm. so uh, so the, the first dose was given but the the second dose was a completely different one. So this was uh, the issue make, making two different types of adenoviral vector vaccines. Yeah. yeah. In Argentina, it was similar. There was a lot, the first uh, dose, and then a lot of people ended up getting some of the other vaccines as the second dose because the the, the actual, you know, per, uh, full vaccination uh, set was not available. But I think it's interesting to see, like, well, the uh, head to head, the comparison of the different platforms. I think that's such a valuable information um, to to have um, because yeah, it will inform future designs for a long time. Yes, and and I and I think you know, uh, looking at all that data, the mRNA vaccines uh, are, are are very immunogenic, and for certain uh, infections, uh, even dengue, you know, like the dengue vaccines, uh, if you have, if you can choose a vaccine platform, it would give durable, long-lasting immunity. Uh, they, uh, I, I mean, that seems like a very promising vaccine platform to develop all type of vaccines. Uh, and it's very rapidly, you know, like usable. So you, you don't need a long, uh, a lot of, uh, so, so even if you get new variants or whatever, it can be rapidly uh, made to, uh, it's, it's not like a whole, uh, like the inactivated vaccines to make sure that it's properly inactivated, uh, you know, then then how much attenuated it is or life life attenuated, you know, all those is, is less complicated. Yeah. So I think that's a really big advancement that happened during COVID. Yeah, for sure. I wanted to ask you also again, we could kind of touch about different subjects, but um I just wanted to ask you about your your position at uh the NDI because I don't think many people know about uh, this this institute and the idea of 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 uh, really repurposing drugs for for diseases, and I think you kind of mentioned trying to see drugs that are already approved in the market and whether they can be um, used for these diseases that it's hard to to fund, you know, completely new research. So I was hoping you can maybe give us a quick overview of of, of your role and and what does DNDI uh, do for those that don't know this initiative. 
Yes, so so that that's a great question. So the the things I was describing about uh, repurposing and all that was was the uh, research I was doing in Sri Lanka. Mm -hmm. Sri Lanka, of course, has been uh, uh, affected by dengue. So that was uh, the st stuff about uh, PAF, uh, uh, you know, leukotriene uh, and the S1 piece work uh, came out of my lab. I joined DNGI in, in uh, 2022, uh, mid-2022. And so to find treatments for dengue, because it's a huge problem in, in many dengue new countries, uh, DNGI established this dengue alliance. Uh, so, to so to have uh, the treatment discovery and treatment led by endemic countries. So in this alliance, we have leading institutions and in endemic countries like the Ministry of Health Malaysia, THSDI from India, uh, Mahidol University from uh, uh, Thailand, and from Brazil, we have Fiocruz and UFMG. So with, with this alliance, we have preclinical working groups with, with scientists from all institutions looking at so many different antiviral compounds to see what you can repurpose looking at host-directed therapies. So uh, uh, we've looked at 23. So these institutes together have uh, screened over 23 antiviral compounds, finding a rodon which could be repurposed. And also uh, there's a clinical working group at the same time designing clinical trials. So uh, for, uh, so, so that immediately when uh, we have drug candidates available, they can be taken forward for uh, clinical trials. So, so for the last little bit, I know you've also worked on the microbiome recently. So I was wondering if you could tell us about some of that work that he's been doing to develop that field in uh, your populations? Yes, so the, I, I'm very much interested in microbiome because uh, I, I think we just began to, I mean, there's a lot of work done on it, uh, but you know, the microbiome is so varied in different populations because, you know, diet plays a huge role uh, on, on the type of microbiome you have. Uh, uh, you 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 know there are ethnic differences. I mean, such a lot of things affect the microbiome. So a lot of microbiome studies are actually from the West, uh, who uh, consume a very different diet uh, than than uh, in a, living in a very different environment than uh, let's say Sri Lankans. So uh, one of the things that we've been looking at is colony cancer and the microbiome, but uh, we're also doing studies on. Uh, obesity, diabetes, and the microbiome, because, uh, and especially also, I want to expand these studies in the context of dengue and other uh, metabolic diseases, because, I mean, although we talk about, you know, diabetes, obesity as, as in, in one area and infectious diseases, you know, like sep trying to separate them, actually, if you look at the morbidity and mortality due to infectious diseases, dengue, COVID, influenza, sepsis, I mean, all of these things, uh, you know, all these uh, diabetes, obesity plays a huge role in causing disease severity. And once you get it to, you know, drive it to more and more complications. So, so I'm really interested in this uh, metabolic disease, uh, diabetes, obesity, and how it affects your immune response to infections angle. And, and this is one of the reasons uh, uh, that I'm also interested in the microbiome. Uh, and because it Leads to so many complications. Uh, I mean, it leads to so many differences in the in, in your immune response. Are there any characteristics of the microbiome of the Sri Lankan population that caught your attention, or they're different to what is reported to from other countries? Uh, so, so, what we've, uh, I, I mean, not not very huge differences, but we do see uh, quite uh, abundance of Proshella. Which is uh, again uh, seen in, uh, I believe, in a very plant-based ba plant diet. I mean, uh, there are some studies from India sh showing vegetarians or people basically uh, having a predominantly plant-based diet have a lot of pressure. And this is what we also see in Sri Lanka, uh, because in Sri Lanka, uh, uh, the diet is mainly plant-based. We eat a lot of uh, plants, uh, and uh, yeah, so and and. Uh, Although people even, I mean, a lot of people are very omnivorous, but still plants and plant proteins play a huge role in our diet. Have you looked at the metabolome at all to see if the, the metabolites produced are still similar across, even if the species change? No. So this is one important thing we want to do, look at metabolites, because we only uh, looked at the microbiome. And uh, so uh, the metabolome is something that is that we are very interested in looking at. Uh, and uh, seeking funding for these things. 
uh, it's, it's not you know the easiest sometimes doing uh, things uh, in uh, in <laughs> in in this part of the world. I I know your previous all guests were from from the west, but you know it's it's sometimes quite challenging uh, doing doing stuff here. Uh, and but this is definitely something we're really trying hard to establish uh, in in Sri Lanka. Yeah, it's hard. I guess oftentimes, you know, you need to send your stuff to for an anal analysis somewhere else because you don't have the equipment, because you don't have the the, the platforms. Yeah, but strangely, you know, uh, that has not happened during the past, I don't know, you know, like so many years, six, seven years. We've, we've done all the, you know, all the things I was talking about, uh, the immune responses to the vaccines, uh, the T-cell responses, flow cytometry, and even all the dengue work. The, the the assays were done in my lab because we have managed the sequencing, uh, the everything we did here. So we have managed to establish uh, facilities here. And I think it's important for capacity building because you can always send samples out, but then you're never going to build capacity within the country. And then, the, and then you never actually develop your labs, isn't it, if, if you don't build uh, capacity locally. So although it's, 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 although it's so much easier to just send it out and get it done, uh, I, I've always tried to, you know, okay, even if it takes longer, let's try to do it here uh, to make sure that, you know, uh, uh, things develop here. Yeah. Yeah. That's important. Just establish the expertise. Yeah, expertise, infrastructure, uh, and all that. So, uh, because otherwise, you know, countries never develop, science never developed in, in uh, uh, countries. So, I, I think it's really important for capacity building. Are there weird barriers to getting the equipment outside of the funds? Uh, yes, so getting 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 a lot of things are uh, quite quite difficult. I mean, we face a lot of challenges doing doing research here, not just equipment, but uh, getting all reagents. Uh, because uh, I mean, that's if you look at the amount of science happen that happen happens in Europe versus amount of science that happens in a country like Sri Lanka, it's like very very little. So. Uh, which means we need to import everything, and so so we have huge challenges uh, in in getting stuff across here. Reagents, just normal cell culture reagents, uh, a set of primers, you know, really very very little stuff. But if every little thing is a huge challenge. But yes, but we still uh, are determined to somehow make it happen. Well, it's good for science that you know people like you are against the odds, or you know, I, keeping keeping the, the the high spirits to to get the the research going uh, all over the world and you know i can relate to that in argentina is also sometimes very hard to get the smallest things and i hear so when i'm here working in europe i'm like oh primers they're gonna arrive tomorrow that's awesome and completely uh, e extraordinary it takes us months to get primers or you know just to get the others process it's it's, it's, it's so yeah. difficult but uh, but we've got a, a huge team working in my lab, a lot of young people, and I really want to encourage them and, and show them, you know, things can happen. Uh, you just need to be at it. Well, that's that's I think that's a good high point to to uh, start wrapping out a conversation. So uh, at the end of our uh, talks, we like to ask our guests a you know different question, something to get to know them a little bit better. Um, so I'm going to, uh, we're going to have a fill in the blanks uh, session here. So if, if you could uh, finish up the sentences for me, uh, that would be great. So for example, it, when I'm not conducting research, I am. Well, ha having fun with my kids or, you know, going running or something like that. So, uh, which I enjoy doing. Uh, my kids are a bit old now, but still, you know, they're my kids. So mm -hmm. yeah. And uh, if I could have one superpower, it would be what? Yeah, so this is something that I dreamt of since I was like, I don't know how old, that, you know, if you could fly, you see, it would be such a <laughs> lot of fun. <laughs> you, see, you know, they're flying and, you know, seeing everything. I, I, I mean, that whole, whole three of floating and things, yeah. So that, that is something I, from, from childhood I've been you know, dreaming about. Of course, you know, never going to happen. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Well, you know, I've also dreamed of flying. That would be such a nice thing to be able to yes, do. Yes, yes, you can be Superman and, you know, like. <laughs> <laughs> I could just fly to work or fly to get the groceries. Yes, that would be yes, great. Even that. Traffic. Just no remember traffic. to yeah. wear your just... goggles because, like, there's a lot oh, yes. of fun in it. 
<clears throat> you know. <laughs> For sure. Okay. And, and for the last, for the last sentence, I can't, can't start the day without my coffee. <laughs> That's a classic yes. response. Yeah. Yes. I, I, I think you need that. Yes. I, I think a lot <laughs> of people need that. Every, any, any particular, is there Sri Lankan coffee? Yes, but 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 it's not strong enough. So I, I like strong coffee, like, you know, really. <laughs> a big mug mar of strong coffee to, to you know, really get me active, yes. Mm -hmm. All right, so then a, a big, I don't know, yes, Jason, do you know what, what would be a strong type of coffee for you? Oh, oh, geez. I mean, you have to go light roast if you really want it strong, and then you have to grind it, and I guess you could either just a standard drip. If you really want strong, you do instant and uh, concentrate. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. yeah, instant, yes. That's the easiest, isn't it? Yes, that's what I do. <laughs> Very well. Well, then, uh, thank you so much uh, for joining us today. It was a very interesting discussion. Uh, so we had on uh, uh, Dr. Nilika Malavije, and uh, from the uh, from Sri Lanka uh, USJ University. Uh, thank you so much for joining us today. It was it was a pleasure talking to you. Thank you. Thank you for having me. It was a pleasure. That brings us to the end of our show. Don't forget to subscribe to our newsletter at www.immunologypodcast.com to get the show notes, including an episode summary, links to all the interview and roundup papers. You can also reach out to us on X at Adam Immuno Podcast or via email at info at immunologypodcast.com for feedback or to suggest guests. See you next time.